state of a servant, for behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm, and he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. That is the song that Mary sung when she found out that she was to be the mother of our Lord and her Lord. And she praised the Lord for the salvation that he was bringing. Um, Welcome this morning to Laurel Bank Baptist Church. I'm glad you're here on Memorial Day weekend as we um, come, as we do every Sunday, to worship in the words of Mary to magnify the Lord for what he's done and the way he has, he has redeemed us. Um, we have so much to be thankful for. I want to say um, something just quickly about Memorial Day. I, I do think it's, it's helpful for us when these days come that we remember in Christ um, the significance of what's going on. Memorial Day has its roots in um, back, at least as far as the Civil War, some people think even further of decorating the graves of those who died in service to the country and for for our protection as people. In the Civil War, it was the great struggle between the North and the South. Then as it continued on into other wars that were fought, we remember those who died for us. That's what we're looking at. And there's something I want you to think about. Have you ever thought about that graveyards are primarily things that belong in churches? There's a reason for that. We in the church make a statement about eternity by saying you don't have to forget about those who have gone on because they will come again. They're not dead, they're just asleep and there's coming a day when we'll all rise and not because of our goodness or our greatness or anything like that but in a way the um, the steeple and the graveyard are two testimonies to the goodness of God because of the steeple those who lay in the graveyard won't stay there forever and that we don't have to try to forget our pain we can look at it we can say you know what This hurts, but one day, because of God, it will all be made right again. It's a wonderful thing for us to celebrate. And I'll tell you the other thing, as we think about Memorial Day, there is another battle that was fought, and another soldier who died, and because of his death, we live. And we should never come to these days that we don't celebrate with the goodness of what Christ has done for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that our, our hearts would reflect Mary's song. That we would sing with our voices to echo our hearts as we think about your love for us. We thank you that you left heaven You set aside your glory. You walked in a perfect way in a a sin-torn world. You suffered for us. You died for us. You defeated death and rose again, and you're now seated at the right hand of the Father and Heavenly Father. And Lord Jesus, we worship you for who you are and what you've done. Pray that you would bless the service, Lord, and this week as we're preparing for Bible school and for all the things that, that are coming up, that you would help us to worship not just with our mouths, not just in our hearts, but in our lives, in our hands, and all that we do. Be glorified and lifted up. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I want to make you aware of just a couple of announcements. One of them is um, this last uh, Friday, two days ago, we had uh, it was a total of 88 that ate. That include all the people that were here working at the churches as well. So we had a good group of people that were here Friday uh, with a foster care meal. So we had a, a wonderful meal together, and then the kids went out and played um, in the field. It was a lot of fun. But continue to remember them, the, the kids, and the foster care parents and their ministry. And um, as we continue to try to help them come alongside the parents and help these young people and from their uh, backgrounds and all the things that they've seen, that we um, show them the love of Christ. That's what we want to do. So that's a wonderful, uh, wonderful um, praise. Um, and also, we have another opportunity to serve coming up. This next coming Sunday is homecoming. Um, I'll be preaching. This is, a, this is a big one. This is our 90th celebration. Um, so that's something I'll, I'll be really excited to talk to you about next week. 90 years Laurel Bank Baptist Church has been here serving the community, loving God and glorifying Him. And that's a wonderful thing. And then um, that always leads into Vacation Bible School. So a week from tomorrow is when Vacation Bible School starts. Um, just in case I forget, we're going to have a quick meeting right after the service for anyone that's helping in Vacation Bible School. If you can come down front, just very brief. It'll be just a couple of minutes. I appreciate that. Are there any other announcements I need to make this morning? Okay. Okay. That's right. Remember, what we do with homecoming is we'll uh, have our morning service, and then we'll have a meal afterwards, and then the evening is spent preparing for Bible school. So we d typically don't ha we won't have a service next Sunday night. Um, but there is a sign-up sheet for uh, the meals for next week, so you can see what others are bringing and, um, and add your name to the list as well. So, any others? Great. Well, Wayne said we really need to make sure the choir is filled up this morning, so come and join us in the choir as, and stand and, and we'll sing together. We got room for you. <clears throat>
202 in your hymn book called Hell the Power. In Jesus' name, number 202.
little medley, you know, so you just sing along with us.
close down and stand and turn around and shake hands with another, one another as our fellowship time.
<clears throat> we'll get ready for the offertory if I just find, just find your seats and we'll... Before we, uh, before we take up the offering. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what's going up next. <laughs> now let's uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer uh, for our offering. Uh, Nathan, you want to lead us? But um, bless this offering. Um, I, um, I thank you for this day. Um, I pray that you would give Papa the words to say. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. In honor of uh, Memorial Day, or actually homecoming too, I'm going through some of the business meeting minutes, and I read this um, last night. I just thought it was interesting. I know we have a lot of new members and visitors. Um, if you go down this hallway right here, like you're going to the ladies' restroom, there's a flag on the wall. And I never knew what it really was until I got reading. In January of 2009, an American flag and a certificate of authenticity was given to Laurel Bank Baptist Church. This flag was flown in honor of, or in the church's honor, on board a KC-135R Strito tanker, if I said that right, during a combat refueling mission. And on board was Sergeant Sharon Cooper, who was a member here. So I thought that was just very interesting, and I just wanted to share that with you today.
that my God was in control. But on the hottest days I cry, oh Lord, isn't it about time? But the potter knows the clay, how much pressure it around the wheel till there's a mission thankful that the God we serve is the... I'm not singing. <laughs> um, that the God that we serve is the creator of the universe. And so because of that, he's also our creator. He knows us. He made us. I ask our kids to come forward for Children's Church this morning. And, um, This morning, I want to talk about four boys, and so I thought I would get some volunteers, Um, and we have four boys sitting up here. Carlos, are you willing to help this morning? Can Yeah? Okay. I'll tell you what. Here's what I want to do, and Paxton, are you willing to help? And my boys don't get a choice. They're they're already... (laughs) No, I'm kidding. They do have a choice, but I'm sure they're willing to. Um, so here's what I want to do this morning. Um, I want to talk about four boys and very quickly just a little bit about their story, and it'll play into um, the sermon this morning. So as we talk about this, I want you to think about these four boys. So let's see here. Carlos, we'll start with you. Come stand up here by me. Okay. Now, I want you to do like this. Show me your muscles. Show everyone your muscles. All right. All right. Stand right here so everyone can see. All right. So there's a young man in the Bible who's famous for being really strong. Who is that person? What's that boy's name? Samson. Very good. Samson was really strong. Okay. So you can just stay right here. Stay right here. All right. Nathan, come next. Now, I want you to, the thing you're going to do is point to heaven. Okay. There's another man. This is in the New Testament. This is probably the toughest one. He's famous for being um, a witness, a testimony to those who are coming to those who are coming after him. A voice crying out in the wilderness. What's his name? Who is it? Say it real loud. John, very good. John the Baptist. I, I couldn't hear the adults. I could hear the kids. So <laughs> y'all got to speak up, adults. So okay. So John the Baptist. He's another boy. All right. Paxton, come here. I want you to um, pretend like you're sleeping. Put your hands under your head. Okay, there we go. There was a boy, and his famous story was he was sleeping when the Lord spoke to him. The Lord called to him when he was asleep. Anyone know who that boy is? Say it loud. Come on, all I hear is kids. That's okay. They need to know that everyone else knows too. (laughs) Samuel, the story of God calling Samuel. Okay, one more boy. And I bet you all will be able to do this. Make uh, like a picture of a cross. No. (laughs) There you go. Like someone on the cross. Good. There you go. Who is this supposed to be? What boy is this? Yes, Jesus. That's right. Now, there's something really special about all four of these boys, you guys are doing such a good job. Are y'all good to keep standing there, or do y'all want to sit down? You good? You gonna sit down? Oh, here, let's let me do it real quick. Okay, okay. First boy, Samson. 
Samson was born to a family that couldn't have a baby. They had been trying to have a baby for a long time, and an angel of the Lord appeared and told him, told them that they were going to have a boy, and they gave him some commands about what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to not cut his hair. He didn't get a haircut. He couldn't eat grapes or drink wine or even have raisins. And he wasn't allowed to touch a dead body. Those three things. What's that vow called? Does anyone know? The Nazarite vow. That's right. So Samson was a Nazarite. Okay? Many, 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 many years later, when Zechariah and Elizabeth were old, an angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah, and he told them the same thing. Even though they couldn't have a baby, they were going to have a baby boy, and he had a special job. He was going to be filled with the Spirit, just like Samson. And he also was not supposed to um, drink wine. So he was a Nazarite. And we actually, I had planned to have some crickets for you to eat since he ate crickets and wild honey, but I, did, I couldn't get them in time, so, um, so I didn't do that. Okay, Samuel is the different one. This morning we'll be talking a little bit more about Samuel. But Samuel's different in that God sent an angel to talk to Samson's parents. God sent an angel to talk to John's parents. God sent an angel to talk to Joseph's parents. Jesus' parents. They sent to Joseph and Mary. <laughs> That's Jesus' parents. But in Samuel's case, it was the mother who went to God. And she said, I want my little boy to be a Nazarite. We're not going to cut his hair. He won't drink strong drink. He's going to be committed to the Lord for his whole life. So three Nazarite boys. And I think that's just very interesting. Now, I read this morning the song that Mary wrote when she found out that she was expecting Jesus. Now, of these... Jesus was not a Nazarite. You can put your arms down. Are they tired? Okay, y'all can sit down. Everyone but Obadiah, stay up here for just a second. But y'all can, you can sit down, Carlos. Good job. Y'all did a great job. Um, Jesus was not a Nazarite. He didn't have to cut his, he didn't, he was able to cut his hair. And um, all of the other things that went with the Nazarite vow did not apply to him. But there is a similarity between Samuel and, and Jesus, and that is the song that their mothers sang. I read to you at the very beginning about Mary's song, and now today for, our, for the sermon, we're going to look at Samuel's mother's song. Her name was Hannah, and she also wrote a song, okay? So let me pray, and then when you go back to your seats, kids, I want you all to be listening and thinking about this song and how close Mary and Hannah were in the things that they praised God about in their song. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these kids. I thank you for their willingness to stand up in front of others and to call out the answers and to think about your word. And Lord, I pray that every one of us would engage with your word, that it would not just be idle things that we tolerate for half an hour on a Sunday, but that these would be the very words of life and that you would put them in our hearts and in our souls. And when trials come and when you are shaping us as the potter shapes the clay, that you would use these words, your words, in us to form us into what you would have us to be. Bless each one of these kids. Bless their homes and their families. And may your name be glorified and lifted up. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all can go back to your seats. If you want to be turning in your Bibles, I want you to have two places open, and I'll be flipping back and forth between them. One of them is Luke chapter 3, chapter 1, Luke chapter 1. And the other one is 1 Samuel chapter 2. Luke chapter 1 in 1 Samuel chapter 2. And it'd probably be helpful if you can flip back and forth between those pretty quickly. As I've been praying about this, and I've known this is here for a long time. This is not new to me um, in terms of, of realizing that this song that Hannah sang is in the Bible, nor is it new to me that this song is so similar to Mary's song. But as I reflected really for the last two weeks 
about this and, and what the Lord would have me share as we look at this, um, I, I think it's what I want to do this morning is, is really it's a continuation of the last two Sundays, and it is a study on worship. What does worship look like? And this is what we're going to read in 1 Samuel is a song of praise. Before I read 1 Samuel, though, I want, you to, I want to remind you of the words of Luke. So Luke chapter 1, I'm going to start reading in verse 46. By the way, these sorts of passages are probably some of the hardest for me because they don't break down in bullets. I like bullets. Jana laughs at me. She thinks I'm the most non-engineer engineer she's ever met. Matter of fact, I think she said that last night, that you're the only engineer I've ever met that's not detailed-oriented, and that's very true. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. But I do recognize the importance of putting things in a detailed manner. And I have a tendency when I read scripture, when I read anything, when I read owner's manuals, to try to understand what's the beginning, what's step one, then step two comes after step one, and let's do it the right way. And that is very Western. But when we read poems, we read um, other forms of songs, very often there's a flow a pattern that just kind of flows through it. And you can't say, all right, point one comes from verse one and point two comes from verse two because there's themes that are running through it. And those are always much harder for me. I have to spend a lot more time. And honestly, I think that's good. What that means is I have to be, the song has to come into me for me to understand what's happening. Does that make sense? And I think that's what is intended as we engage with Scripture, that it becomes part of us. And so I know I just read this, but let me read it again. After Mary found out that she was going to give birth to Jesus, who was going to be the Messiah, this is what she says. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm, and he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel. In remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. If you will now look in 1 Samuel chapter 2. If you remember the story as we've been walking through it, there was a woman who couldn't have a baby. She went to the tabernacle and she prayed that the Lord would give her a baby. And she vowed a vow. That if you give me a boy, I will give him back to the Lord and he will be lent forever to serve you here. The Lord honored that request. She had a baby and at the proper time when the baby was weaned, when she could fully give him to the Lord and not have to go back to him at all, she took him to the tabernacle. She presented him to Eli And we're told that as they did that, that he, and I take that to mean the little boy, Samuel, worshipped the Lord. And it's at that time that we begin chapter 2. And it's at that time that, uh, and Hannah prayed and said, this is 1 Samuel chapter 2. My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Do you see how similar that is? Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Hannah says, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemy because I rejoice in your salvation. So here's what I want you to see. God is worthy of my praise. 
both of these songs, what they begin with saying is actually, um, I am choosing to participate in worship. Now, I have a little bit, I struggle sometimes with a lot of the songs that we sing. We have to be careful even in our hymn books and definitely on the radio that so many of the songs are really all about me. And if you listen to it, what it's really saying is me, 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 me. God loves me. God is good to me. God is happy for me. Uh, you know, and it becomes very me-centered. We have to be careful of that. But there is a point in which we say, of all the people out here that are choosing to worship the Lord, I don't, I'm not concerned with them. I am going to worship the Lord. Okay? It's one thing to say God is worthy of praise. It is a whole other thing to say God is worthy of my praise. And what I want you to notice is both of these women, God did a miracle in their life. One of the women who had been trying to have a baby for a long time and couldn't, and God did a miracle and gave her a baby. The other one had not been trying at all and couldn't, and God gave her a baby. And in both of their cases, there were responses to say, you know, a lot of people can worship the Lord, but my heart will worship the Lord today. That's the first point that I want you to see, is that God is worthy of my praise. And if you notice what Hannah says, she talks about two aspects. One, she says, my heart exalts in the Lord. So we need to be worshiping from the heart. It should not be that what we do on Sunday morning is we stand and we sing. I'm, I enjoy music. I almost said I'm a musical person. That's probably not. That's someone else's decision <laughs> about whether they think I'm musical or not. But I like music. I'll say it that way. And I enjoy the, the challenge of reading music and trying to get my fingers to follow the page or following my ears and try to get the sound to match what it ought to sound. And sometimes that's a danger as a musician to worship the Lord because you can get so involved with the technical stuff. Did we sing it at the right volume? Did we um, do all the things, speed up and slow down and keep the pitch right and make the tone right and all of these things? And at, if we're not careful, our heart isn't in it. By the way, Wayne, to me, is a wonderful instructor in worship. Because when you watch him worship, there is no question that his heart is leading in the worship. And all the other things, all the technical things that happen are flowing out of what starts with, I am choosing for my heart to worship the Lord. Worship needs to be from the heart. But secondly, worship needs to be with your mouth. Some people will take that and say, well, you know, I just, I'm, you know, I'm worshiping on the inside. You can't see it on the outside, but I'm worshiping on the inside. Both of these are songs, which means they were said out loud. They were for others to hear. And part of our worship is a testimony to others. People don't like your singing, tell them to get some cotton. You've got something to say. <laughs> the point is, is that you have a mouth that you were given, and you should use what you were given for the glory of God. Use your mouth to worship the Lord. You worship with your heart, and you worship with your mouth. The second thing that we should see, and this is an attribute of, or it's a, it's a characteristic of who God is. Both of these women, right off the bat, when they started talking about worship, what they recognized is that God is their Savior. Okay, let me read it for you. This is interesting. Mary understands that her baby is going to be her Savior. Mary says, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Hannah says, I rejoice in your salvation. Both of them recognize that a heart of praise comes from recognizing what God has done for us. If you try, this is why I struggle sometimes with some of the songs that we sing if you try to only worship the Lord because of what he's doing in the world around you right immediately, when the world around you doesn't go well, there'll be nothing for you to worship on. 
But if you worship God based on the fact that he has saved you from your sin, then there is always cause to worship. There is never a time that we can say, yeah, I just can't worship right now. I know I've mentioned this recently, but that's exactly what Job did in the middle of his trial. After God took every, God allowed everything to be taken from him, he came and he put dust on his head and his lay, he laid out on the ground in sackcloth and in ashes and he said, naked I came from my womb, from the womb, and naked I will return. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the Bible says, and he worshiped. It's got to be deeper than just what we're feeling at the moment. And it needs to be based on a reality. And the reality is, is that God is, for those of us who have trusted in him, he is our savior. So that's why we worship Thirdly, and both of them do this, and uh, Mary does this in verse 49. She, she says, For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. She says that God's name is holy. Hannah says it this way, There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. So thirdly, God is worthy of my praise. God is my Savior. God is holy. Why do we worship the Lord? Because there is none like Him. We, yeah, we worship Him because He saved us. And we worship him because he is holy and there's no one like our God. Hannah actually gives us some specifics. She says, he is unique. There is none like you. Sorry. Mary says, he is mighty. He... he who is mighty, has done great things for me. And then Hannah says something interesting. She says, there is no rock like my God. I know on, when we were studying the Psalms on Wednesday, Wednesday night, we were praying through the Psalms for three years. Every Wednesday night, we looked at Psalms. We went through all 150 of them. And as we did that, one of the things that comes up over and over again is the psalmist would say about God, you are my rock. And for those of you that were for there, what was another way he would say that? You are my rock, my refuge, my, what else? Foundation, my fo fortress. All of those things are all saying the same thing. Here is the picture. If you want to build a secure fort to protect you from the enemy, what you're looking for is bedrock for you to build your foundation on. And when you do that, you can come to the rock and you can be safe. What Hannah is saying is, I have found a place to run to and that place is God. He is unique, he is mighty, and he is my protector. Like no one else can be, he is holy. Now, this fourth one is kind of interesting. And it's so funny to me. I, I can feel the pressure in, in our American churches. And it's not just America. It's the entire Western culture. We have become so um, wishy-washy in convictions. Here's the right way to say it. We have become so unjust that justice bothers us. Now, just so you understand what I mean by that, the next point that I see both of these women doing is they acknowledge that God is judge. Listen to how Mary says it. Verse 50. Well, I'm going to start in verse 48. He has looked on the humble estate of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. 
For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. Do you get the understanding that God understands people's hearts and God makes decisions on them based on their hearts? The proud, he scatters. The humble, he exalts. We don't like that. What we want is for everyone to be tolerant of everything. You do it your way, I do it my way, we all do it however we want. If you want to be proud, that's fine. If you want to be humble, that's good too, I like that. And what we lose when we do that is there is no longer an anchor of what, what is right. What is the right way to live? You know what the chief problem with pride is? It's wrong. No one has a right to be proud. What are you proud of? Whatever it is, you, you were given it. It's not yours. And so the problem with pride is it's, it is trying to put yourself where God is, and that's not where you belong, and so it's a lie. And so the God who knows all that is makes a decision. Again, we read in Hannah's words, she spells it out a lot further. Matter of fact, verses 3 through 8 are all talking about this. And this is what I was talking about. If you read this, I'm going to make some points here, but they're not going to be linear points. If you look at these, he's, she's going to kind of mention something and talk about something else and then come back to it again. But you'll hear these three rolling around in here. Talk. No, this is 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 3. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The, ba- the bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren have borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life, and he brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. You get the point? He is judge. We worship God because he is judge. And there's two special things that he's looking for. We read from both what Mary had to say and from what Hannah had to say. We read that he punishes arrogance and that he rewards humility. I have the uh, privilege, responsibility, of giving exams. And I can always tell a first exam because the students are trying to figure out the professor. What does he expect? What does he want? And so I have to make my expectations clear. But honestly, until they get something back, something I've graded, They don't really get a good indication of exactly what kind of grader I'm going to be. Don't you want to know what the judge of all the earth, what his standards are? (laughs) What does he expect? What are his tests like? Here it is. God punishes arrogance and rewards humility. And she, Hannah mentions it in three different ways. In war, those who think they're going to win end up not winning. And those who it looks like they're going to lose end up winning. Why? Because God is judge. And as judge, he exercises his judgment in war. In wealth, there's some people who don't have bread and God gives them bread. And there are others who have plenty to eat and God takes it away. There are some who are poor and God makes them rich. There are some who are rich and God makes them poor. Now, is this saying that all 
What is this saying? Well, it's telling us about that God has the ability to judge the world. He makes the decision. Who wins in war? Who God says. Who wins in wealth? Who God says. Who wins even in life? There are some who want to have kids and can't. There are some who don't want to have kids and can. And in all of those, God is still in charge. He is the one overall. And what is, what, what's the answer? The answer is you live your life in humility and God will do what God will do. We don't worship the Lord because of what he's given us. Well, that's not true. We're thankful for what he gives us. But we worship the Lord because he is able to give us what he chooses to give to us. Then finally, God is worthy of my praise. God is my Savior. God is holy. God is judge. And the last thing we see is actually similar to the other one, and that is that God is sovereign. What Hannah says, beginning in verse 50, she says, Her, His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of his hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. The point that I think Mary is making here, God made a promise to Abraham and because he is God, there is no chance that that promise will not be fulfilled. He's in charge. And you might think, you know, we, we look from all these years down at the, the genealogy of Jesus and we say, oh, wow, man, that, that David's line is a strong thing. You know, it's not. It really wasn't. In Joseph's day, when he shows up, in Bethlehem, in the city of the king, even though he's of the line and lineage of David, he can't even get a room at the inn. He's not a special person because the line of David, to the people who lived in those days, had all but failed. There were no kings that came out of the line of David for hundreds of years before that. And so it would have been very easy for people to be looking around and saying, matter of fact, that's what it says, out of the stump that is the root of Jesse comes a branch. In other words, that big tree has been chopped down a long time ago and there is nothing there. And the people who lived in Jesus' day, that's what they thought of the line of David. It was done. The problem is, is that God said it wasn't done. And God is sovereign. And that's what Mary is magnifying before Jesus was ever born. She's saying, and this is the God who is sovereign over all. He made a promise to Abraham, and he will bring it to fulfillment. It's also what Hannah is saying. Look at verse 9. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Hannah is an interesting person. She is writing this song at a time when Israel had no king. Let me say that again. Hannah sings this song before the first king of Israel had ever happened. Matter of fact, her little boy, Samuel, would grow up and when he is an old man, he will anoint the first king of Israel. And yet she says... The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. There are times I read scripture and I have no idea what she had in her mind when she said those words. How could she have known? 
And the answer is only by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit could she have known that there was coming a king. And it wasn't going to be Saul. He's a failure. And it's not going to be David. His line goes out. It's not going to be Solomon. It's not going to be Rehoboam. It's not going to be Asa. It's not, I mean, you could be going down the whole list of all the kings of Israel that lived. It's none of those. But once the kingship stops... And, the Israel goes, and Israel goes into captivity, and the people are plundered, and someone else takes over, and everything looks like it's over. God will move, and his king of kings will be shown to be the anointed and stand up again. Why do we worship? We worship because God is doing what he will do. The more I think about it, the songs that Christy sang... God is the potter. And he knows the end from the beginning before the first thing happens. He knows it. And all things are working together into his perfect plan as they fit. I would encourage you to think back through the last chapters so much more that I've already said that I want to say again. It would be easy if you're just reading this and not thinking about it. You read what Hannah says and you think she's just making fun of a rival wife. Or that the whole thing is she just wanted a baby and God just didn't give her what she wanted. It's not the story. The story is a woman who was being prevented from worshiping the Lord and what God did to make it so that she could worship. He saved her so that she could worship him as he deserves to be worshiped. And this is the overflow of what happened. I think it is a pattern for us. You, God, deserves your praise. He is your Savior, if you will trust him. He is holy. There is no one else worthy of your trust. He is judge, whether you like it or not. It's his rules that govern the world, and he is sovereign. He will do what he will do. And for all of those reasons, our heart and our mouth ought to be praising the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, be exalted in us. (laughs) And Lord, that's an easy thing for me to pray because I know it's true. In one way or another, you will be exalted in us. For those who come to you with humility, recognizing our own failings and our need for you, you will show mercy and you will be exalted as our Savior. And for those who thumb their nose at you, who walk in arrogance and try to act as if their ways are just fine without any help, you will glorify yourself as you demonstrate your righteousness in judgment. And so, Lord, it's an easy thing for me to pray that you would exalt yourselves in us because I know that you will do it. I pray, Lord, that those that are here, that we who have gathered this Sunday morning in this place to worship you, that we would all be in that first group of people who humbly come recognizing our need and recognizing the payment that you made and rejoicing in the salvation that you alone could wrought and you alone did bring to pass. Lord, if there's any here who are not in that place, I pray that you would break their arrogance and help them to humbly accept your word. Guide and direct our steps. Use us for your kingdom. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing a hymn of invitation. Number 307. Just as 
I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I come just as I am and waiting on to rid my soul of one dark plot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, me. Fighting within and fierce without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Amen. Just thinking about the needs in the church, and there are a lot. Physical needs, emotional needs, some that are minor, others that are very major. Um, and I think about as we're coming into a week that this is, I, I, since I've come to Laurel Bank, I, I think I've always understood this first week in June to be the week of service for the church. It's what we're looking forward to for the year, pouring ourselves into we have the opportunity to share the goodness of the gospel during this week. And um, as we look forward to that week coming, um, we need to be in prayer about that. There's just a lot of things to be praying for. It doesn't mean we're defeated for all the things that we just said. Um, but it does mean that we need to be in communion with the Lord, talking to him. Let's do this. Um, don't forget, we're going to have a Bible school meeting immediately afterward. Why don't we meet on this side, if that's all right? So if, uh, just come up very quickly after here, after the service. Um, as we are, are dismissed, um, that song, Just As I Am, I, it's such a good testimony. And I, I like finishing the service with a song. I think it's appropriate that we do that, that we go out singing. And... Um, there are several songs that we go to a lot, the, the family of God, that we are reminded that we are a family as we leave. And this one, just as I am, that I bring nothing but me. <laughs> I come just like I am, and God uses me. So why don't we be dismissed? Let's just sing that first verse again, and we'll be dismissed this morning. Oh